Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Altitude. Of course, I'm your host, Woody Woodworth. I have with me today a very special guest, someone I've been looking forward to interviewing and talking to for a long time, Muhammad Ghassan. He is a cloud security architect at no other place other than the prestigious SAP. Muhammad, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Muhammad, you and I have spoken at several times prior to this at a tech meeting in Seattle, and then we've had a couple of phone calls. So I've come to learn a little bit more about you and your history. And I know that you hail from Tunisia and that you spent a lot of time in France. Yeah, exactly. And then are now, of course, stateside here working for SAP. So talk me through a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities you have getting into technology coming from a country like Tunisia. And what decisions did you make that kind of led you on the path that you have taken? Okay, so as you said, I came from Tunisia. It's a nice and a beautiful country in the south of Mediterranean. And uh, we have also a very, a very strong, you know, uh, tech background there in Tunisia. So I got an excellent background and knowledge in tech industry. I did my studies in Tunisia. I did an engineering school. It's the National Engineering School of Tunis. Got specialized in telecommunication. I think uh, in the United States, it's called electrical engineering, right? And then I got specialized in, um, in IT. I continued my studies in France. And then here I am in the United States. So did you know that you wanted to be in cloud security for a long time? Or was it something that you just kind of fell into? Uh, in fact, what I already know about myself, I know that I want to get into uh, architecture roles, okay? In design, in design roles. So I really wanted to see the overall, you know, the overall picture of the IT landscape. I wanted to design and to argue about the architecture choices. Mainly, I, I focused on networking at the beginning of my career and even in my academic background, I focused on networking. But we already know that cloud is the new area of networking, right? So just uh, that's exactly how I got moved to the cloud. All right. And so you've been at SAP, I think, last time we spoke, almost five years. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And you've done security the whole time there, first in, as an engineer and now as an architect. And if I'm not mistaken, yeah. you are also doing security prior to cloud in the traditional data center space, right? Yeah, exactly. In fact, security is a very big topic. So we cannot just, you know, see it in the, in the cloud or in on-premise, right? because the security is, um, is a way of thinking. And of course, we apply the security principles in the cloud, on-premise, in corporate, in applications, in whatever, right? Yeah, absolutely. You're right. I mean, it's a huge space, not one single discipline in security, but dozens of them. So we often spend time talking about network security on this show because I'm just more of a network-centric person. But I think for the purpose of this show, it would be fun to talk a little bit about architecture and design, which is something that, you know, we haven't really explored on Altitude. And I'm, I'm excited to kind of delve into that further. Obviously, the way that you build a secure perimeter in the data center will be different than the way you approach some concept of perimeter in the cloud. Exactly. And the cloud might not even have a perimeter as such. So kind of walk me through that. How was it for you to approach this idea of a perimeter when you first started designing for cloud? So in fact, before moving to the cloud, let's see about how we would see security in a classic you know, context, right? So we can imagine the assets to be protected like a castle. And around that castle, we are building a layers of security, right? So that's exactly the centric approach. We have, you know, central assets. We move everything in a single area. Well, that's exactly what we call, for example, uh, DMZ, right? Or uh, zone one, zone two, or whatever. And around this area, we place a couple of, you know, firewalls, a couple of, you know, IPS IDS, and that's exactly we secure things. It works very well in the in on-premise, right? Or in a classic context. But in the cloud, there is no perimeter. Your assets are everywhere. If you want to focus on an, uh, on an area, you will be missing, you know, some other areas. Right now, we are we are talking about serverless, about uh, full uh, full mesh connectivity, about decentral decentralization. So this approach cannot work anymore. And in order to secure the cloud, we have to adopt another approach. And what what approach do you think that would be? I mean, there's a couple of different ways, right? So let me play that question out a little bit more before I just throw it at you. One of them is 
people would say, just use cloud native services to do it. Mm -hmm use managed services, refactor your applications to be more PaaS and SaaS oriented. And then the security is just kind of taken care of in the managed tier. You don't have to worry about it. There is another group of people that say, just try to use security groups and the other cloud native concepts together with containers or IaaS. So it's kind of a blended approach from the PaaSify everything um, that you don't really need intrusion detection systems anymore move the security into the app itself. So use agents everywhere and, you know, minimize the security presence in the network and do it all app-centric kind of stuff. And then there's a third group of people, and these are broad strokes I'm painting with, that would say, no, there's still <laughs> too many heritage or legacy applications in the cloud to follow that approach and that the network still matters and that we need a network-centric design. Um, and then we'll peel that onion if, if we want to. So what are your thoughts about that? I would say that regardless of the approach, there are general principles to be, uh, to be you know, uh, respected or applied, right? I would say that the first approach here is security by design. Here we are not talking about security as, you know, um, as an addition, right? Or as something like as a feature, right? Security is not a feature. Security is a must. And it must be done and it must be handled by design from the early design phase of a, of a product it's an integration more than you know an, an addition you know the second principle here is i would say security in depth so we have multiple layers so we need to we need to integrate security in each and every layer for example here let's see in the cloud you already mentioned you know the cloud native tools like security groups like knuckles network access control list that's exactly the layers of security imagine that we have some applications deployed in some VMs. So we need to take care about, you know, the application security layer, which is the security of the application itself, the security of the infrastructure, security group, knuckles, whatever. We take care also about, you know, the security as a perimeter, investigating, for example, traffic north, south, or east, west. Security here, we are building multiple layers, and each and every layer is, you know, secured independently from the other layers. I cannot say, for example, as long as I have a security group, there is no need, for example, to secure my application. It doesn't mean that I have a security group that I can disregard, you know, the security of my application at the application level. That's exactly what I call security in depth. And of course, the third principle here is, you know, the very known, you know, principle of the least privilege principle. That also, that's also security. It doesn't mean that, you know, I secured everything. Just I will need to give access to only, you know, the least amount of privilege would be needed in order to execute my, my, my job properly. As a network, you know, for example, uh, engineer, I just give my, uh, my network engineer privilege to get my job, you know, properly, but I don't give any access of privilege or of visibility, right? And the last thing here, I would say, we should not, you know, disregard the human factor as well. Because if I secure my network very well, but my staff is not, you know, uh, is not aware or they, uh, they are not well formed against human attacks like social engineering, hijacking or, what, or whatever. So I just compromise each and everything, each and every security control I, I met. Yeah, I, I remember seeing a T-shirt uh, when I went to DEF CON one year some time ago that just said there's no patch for stupidity. Yeah, exactly. Pretty great shirt. <laughs> Meaning... No matter how yeah. up to date your architecture or code or any of that stuff is, humans will always be the weakest link in the security chain because they're the easiest ones to trick, right? Yeah, exactly. I can I can put you know one hundred locker in my in my safe, but if I give you the key, so what's the point right. of the lock? <laughs> right. Right. So let's focus on the design piece because I really like that term you use, secure by design. Blend that with the idea that you you know, have discussed that the perimeter in cloud really doesn't exist in any way, shape or form that data center uh, security people recognize. Not that there is a data center security person anymore, but, you know, security yeah. designs from the data center don't recognize or deal with the way perimeter works in cloud. What kind of designer designs are you working with to kind of reconcile that, that you need a holistic early in secure design in the cloud? 
an architecture that supports growth and scale and tiered security, as you mentioned, you know, security at different levels, all the way up to the human, can't forget the human, but then also accounts for this super agile, explosive growth in cloud. How do we go about, uh, you know, bringing those together? Uh, in fact, first of all, I would say that the data center security is not gone, right? But it's uh, just got transferred to other people. It's exactly, you know, the, the shared security model between, between you and the cloud. The data center security right now is the responsibility of the, of, the, of the cloud provider. It's not my responsibility anymore, but it still exists, right? Second thing here, we are talking about security by design. So we are, we are you know, taking security into account from the early design phase of the, of the project. For example, think of an, uh, some application with, with an API gateway. So how, how are we going to secure those if we just you know, focus on developing you know, the, the, the core features of the application, but we didn't think about, for example, how many times can we call those, uh, uh, those APIs and uh, how to authenticate you know, the color to those APIs. For example, you know, uh, distinguish between a genuine, genuine call and, uh, let's say, for example, DDoS attempt. So we have to think about those questions and we have to integrate those questions as soon as, you know, starting the development of the core features of those, you know, APIs and those lambdas. That's exactly what I mean by security by design. Not just, you know, developing everything, developing your application and just put an APS IDS in front and you are, you are safe. No, you are not safe with that. What are some techniques for helping cloud security professionals work early and often with developers? In my experience, that is one of the biggest challenges of cloud is that in order to be secure by design, you really have to have an in-depth conversation about how the application works to your exact point. If you don't understand how the API is functioning, what it's calling, what permissions the API needs, which are things typical security and network engineers have not had to worry about in the past because it's all just running in TLS in the data center. It goes to the firewall and that's, that's kind of it. What do we do to foster and create collaboration between security and you know, DevOps folks today? I mean, is it just send them a lot of invites for meetings? Is it try to create a culture that's more sustainable for these two teams to work together? Is it to train our security professionals more on code? so that they can kind of speak the language that the developer speaks and the conversation is easier. I mean, share your thoughts on that. We should, you know, unify the language. Okay. So because usually and traditionally the developers speak a language and the, you know, the security folks speak another language and we need something like a translator between them, right? This, this won't work anymore. Yeah. That's why right now we are talking about trends like DevOps, like DevSecOps. Even like, you know, uh, like, you know, FinOps, for example, FinOps, for example, because after all, finance is a part of security. Well, this is, this is my personal point of view. For example, when I have a DDoS attack and my infrastructure scale, scale up, and uh, as you know, in the cloud, if, you, if your infrastructure scale up, you have, to, you have to pay, right? And when you pay, you just lose money. So that's exactly security, right? So... I said that we are talking about trends like DevOps, DevSecOps, FinOps. So we integrate, you know, the security directly in the pipeline, in the CI, in the CI CD, right? We can build a pipeline, for example, when we push a new code to some repo, to some Git repo, we can trigger, for example, a code analysis with, for example, let's see SonarCube or with another tool. That's exactly how things should, uh, should work right now. And uh, that's exactly the integration or the fusion between security and development. A developer should have basic understanding about, for example, the, the features of a weak code, the vulnerabilities of a weak code, something like, for example, uh, buffer overflow, like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, code injection. Like, I know that in the, in the past, they are, not, they are not supposed to know that stuff, but right now they, they should know. And the same for the security folks. They should have an understanding about, you know, the APIs, about how do they work, for example, in Java or in C Sharp or in any other, la in, in any other language, they should know what does it mean by, you know, object-oriented programming and uh, dynamic variables. Are, well, my idea here is the developers should know more about the security stuff and the security guys should know more about the development stuff. Right. 
Yeah. Oh, in a perfect world, that's exactly what should happen. I think, you know, different organizations and, and businesses achieve that goal to different degrees. Clearly, you know, DevOps is much more focused lately on the ops as opposed to the dev. And, you know, a good DevOps professional knows as much about operations and build as they do about developing and, and curating code. Um, yeah. And then likewise, cloud security professionals more and more are getting more agile and diving more into how um, code repositories work and how, you know, CI, CI, CD pipelines work and continuous development tools and ecosystems work, et cetera. But it, it's kind of overwhelming. So, I mean, I took some classes earlier on in my life that like I took a Perl programming class and at night school and I took a Python programming class and there's a lot of online stuff available. But I, I think the challenge is one, for existing professionals that started their career in the data center, it's kind of expensive and time consuming, you know, to try to retrofit yourself, your resume, your skill set with that kind of stuff, because you have your day job, right? You've got alarms going off everywhere. You might have alert fatigue. You've got security incidents and God knows what to take care of. So could you share any advice to people that are trying to kind of reach that next level and bend in more in the DevSecOps world so that, you know, they can have this unity with the Agile folks? Yeah, in fact, I would say the key word here is, you know, um, curiosity. They should be more curious about, you know, the about the tools, about the trends in the industry, about how to do how to do things. Of course, they should do an, a continuous, you know, upskill, upskilling. They, they say, you know, what are the problems right now? How to solve them? There are many, you know, many platforms, many, many learning resources in YouTube. Also, personally, I purchase many Udemy courses as well. So I would find it an excellent, you know, source of learning. That's a great answer. And thank you for letting me pick your brain. It's just so cool to see how a cloud security architect works and thinks and acts, you know, in real time, it's, it's, it's yeah. a treat. We've talked a lot about the differences of thinking about security as we transition from a data center to cloud. We've been over all of that. What about cloud going back and informing the data center? Because, you know, I spent a lot of time on this show looking at challenges for the cloud and how people overcome them. But of course, the cloud is the birthplace for a lot of fantastic innovation. Right, it's all about agility and innovation. So, what's being done in security in the cloud isn't always a sad or hard story. There's some fantastic stuff happening there, especially with the emergence of DevSecOps and this idea of security as code, infrastructure as code, and being able to speed things up and optimize things, and in the end, save a lot of money because if you can automate things and orchestrate things, you can get stuff done in half of the time and a quarter of the time, and etc. What do you think is some of the most important stuff you're doing in the cloud that can go back and inform data center models and maybe change the way traditional security people are thinking? The problem here right now, we are, see, we are seeing the cloud as, you know, a, an on-premise extension, right? Cloud is just, you know, uh, someone else's computer. No, the cloud, is an, the cloud is a cloud. It's another very new, you know, uh, concept, a new paradigm. It, you know, requires a new way of thinking. Doing security in the cloud is not like doing security in on-premise. But I would say the general security principles are always valid, regardless if they are in the cloud or in on-premise. A principle like the least, the least privilege, the need to know, like the, are always valid, regardless if, they, if it's in the cloud or in on-premise. Right. But, ju but just the way of doing them is different. How do you see, you know, security in the cloud? How do you, you know, define security in the cloud? Let's say for someone who doesn't have any background on that. It's a great question. There was a different answer to that question four years ago because a lot of stuff has changed in the cloud very quickly because just only very recently has cloud really become fully mature, both in terms of the services it offers and in terms of the workloads that are actually running there, right? I mean, it's a bit of a hockey stick motion, so... All of a sudden in the last year, post-COVID, you know, post-2020, we we're reaching critical mass in terms of all the stuff that's, that's going to cloud, which is fantastic. I think I would describe cloud security, to your point, a hybrid version between a completely DevOps-centric world and a traditional data center world. That we have two kind of diametrically opposed paradigms that are trying to meet in the middle and congeal into some kind of perfect hole. 
So in that description where we're in a hybrid world, where we have traditional security things showing up in the cloud, like traditional firewalls that are just been virtualized, mixing in and blending in with things like security groups and IaaS and PaaS services, we're going to have some winners and some losers in terms of that outcome. That hybrid mix is not a perfect arrangement. And so some people lean in more on the agile side, some people lean in more on the traditional side and they can make either one work, but we haven't yet found this Goldilocks zone where you find this sustainable agile security ecosystem that also fits and ticks all the check boxes that the traditional applications have. And there's a whole other conversation about what's needed to create that Goldilocks zone. I work at Aviatrix, but that's why I came over here. The security uh, has to be embedded in the network in terms of the network security piece, because the network is the only thing that's going to scale as quickly as the application. You could never create like a bolt-on security system that will grow and follow the application. So if the network isn't secure throughout itself and it isn't progr programmable, you're always going to be on the wrong side of that equation. Now, there's a lot more that goes into it than that. I think the second thing is exactly what you said, which is that we need a more common language between security professionals and DevOps people. There will be a new role. Maybe it's a DevSecOps engineer or DevSecOps architect. I mean, we have all these DevOps stuff floating around in the industry, but there will be the birth of this new kind of security professional that embraces both sides of that. I think we'll see that in the next two or three years. As you said, that security here in the, in the, in the cloud, and especially at the network level, it's uh, very important because, again, we said that, uh, that the, the cloud is not on-premise, is not a local data center, but especially the, the, the difference here is very clear in terms of networking. In data centers, we have to deal you know, with a couple of routers, switch about you know, some bridge, some whatever, right? Legacy networking, but in the cloud, we don't see any, we don't see any of those. In the cloud, we have to deal with routing tables, with, you know, hybrid environments. Right now we are talking about cloud, but what about multi-cloud? Why we should get stuck with just one cloud provider? If, for example, one cloud provider gives us the best of networking, the best of, you know, uh, compute, and the other cloud provider gives us the best of storage. So just why not combine the, the, the two of them, the, the two of the guys, right? So here right. networking, networking would be very, very different between the on-premise and between the cloud and even between cloud one and uh, cloud two, right? And everything should, should be run, you know, uh, in a transparent way to the, to the developer. Because again, we said that the, the, the developer must speak the language of the security folks or of the network folks, but not to uh, to very deep um, extent, right? After all, a developer is a developer. He should focus only on the business side of his application so I would say the value added of any cloud, you know, tool is just to uh, abstract this layer and to give something which is transparent to the developer. So they only focus on their, on their business development without, you know, taking care of those kind of uh, networking problems. Oh, I mean, 100%. Okay, so first of all, we both know multi-cloud is real. That conversation is done. All of the industry analysts and customer mm -hmm. and business testimonials are ringing super true on that. So it's real, it's here to stay, and it's only going to grow. The issue yeah. then is that each one of these ecosystems are bespoke. And so it's not like I can go and drive a Chevy truck and then get in my wife's Honda and drive that and then drive my daughter's Toyota or whatever. She's 11. She doesn't have a car yet. I'm just making this up. <laughs> and, but basically my knowledge on how to drive maps very cleanly to each different vehicle because there's some sense of standardization and organization here. Okay, maybe the turn signals on the other side of the column or something, but it, it only takes most people, I don't know, under 60 seconds to kind of figure out where the buttons are in the car. And then the fundamentals are the same is what I'm trying to say. But what we've done here is we've created three completely or four completely different vehicles. You know, so I step out of my Chevy truck and I get into this new vehicle and it's completely different. Instead of a steering wheel, there's a lever. 
There's three pedals on the ground. The instrument gauge is in a completely different language and none of the buttons do any of the things that I expect that they do. So that's the position that I think both security people are in and IT people are in. And so what do they do? They say, well, God, I'm going to bring in the thing that I know works best, which is my on-prem ecosystems, because no matter what's happening, at least I know it works and acts and feels the same. So in come the Cisco's, in come the Palos, the checkpoints, the F5s, right? And they say, this is a great way to handle multi-cloud because at least I'll get some kind of overlay that's built on a technology that's uniform. Okay, but it's a trap. The problem is, is that none of those products were ever designed to run on the cloud. So you have to force the network fabric of the cloud to their will. They don't understand cloud routing tables. They don't know th that there's not, that the ARP on the wire is a manufactured fictitious ARP. So that causes a tremendous explosion of complexity and cost, which is why you see this one group of people that are saying, okay, jettison all that, just find a way to use cloud native stuff for security, right? And do it in these managed services. But then that leaves people out in the cold because various features aren't mature kind of yet. Like they don't do all the deep critical things that some of this data center stuff does because the applications still require that level of competency. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of this mash of things. Uh, and it's not a harmonious world yet. I would say that the cloud right now is not the trend anymore. The trend right now is multi-cloud. Yes. The full mesh connectivity, right? Yeah. We are looking for, you know, not a unique ship, but just, you know, a standardized engine for each and every cloud provider. So which help the, the developers and the software engineers to just focus on their development, right? For example, here we have many brands of smartphones, right? But all of them are using the same Wi-Fi standard. Right. Yep. That what, uh, was the ideal case for, for the cloud, especially for the public cloud. We have multiple cloud providers, but we will have, you know, just one, sta one standard of how doing things. Of course, it's not possible to oblige each and every cloud provider to standardize things. That's not possible. So that's exactly the role of the cloud vendors. I would say that a vendor would be successful if he can build some abstraction layer that unify the cloud providers and to simplify you know, the tasks of the, of the software engineer or of the developer. Here, I am really talking about an abstraction layer and that abstraction layer, this is exactly the value added you know, in the cloud tools market. Yes. Whatever, you know, security or you know, networking or whatever, visibility or yum. Right, it's, it has to be about abstraction. And I think yep. that was your earlier point about developers, which was, you know, they're developing, that's their primary role. Yes, they need to have some fundamental knowledge about security. Um, so they need to lean in on security more, but they don't need to know how all the knobs work, right? They just need to know how to express the intent about what their application does and how it should be best secured. And then the adaption layer should translate that intent to meaningful policy, turning the knobs in a certain way. So I 100% I agree. If we don't arrive at some sophisticated level of abstraction, the Goldilocks zone will never form. We're either going to be too hot or too cold, right? No one can get the pores just the right way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, you know, each cloud provider uh, is doing, you know, is doing fix in his own way, right? For example, networking in AWS is not exactly the networking in Azure. It's not exactly networking in GCP. And yes. uh, in, in a hybrid scenario in an, or in a multi-cloud scenario, as a developer, should I focus, you know, on, for example, um, on guard duty in AWS or on the equivalent service in GCP or in the equivalent service in Azure for the, for the visibility? Should I focus on the CloudWatch in AWS or on the metrics given by GCP or Azure? So how am I supposed to reconcile and to, you know, aggregate all of those? That's exactly not my job as a developer, but that's exactly the job of people wanting to make money from the cloud, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you must deal with alert fatigue in your world, right? Or at least, well, you're an architect now and have been for some time, but you were an engineer prior to that. And I imagine you were probably closer to the screen of screens, whatever, the single pane of glass. Although I've heard it referred to as a single, what is it, a single glass of pain? Yeah, or the big... <laughs> <laughs> so... 
I mean, alert fatigue's got to be a real thing too, right? Without abstraction, because each of yep. the CSB ecosystems is alarming and alerting in a different way. I mean, yep. yeah, you could pipe everything to syslog and use a sim, but still the quantity and quality of the alarms and alerts will be different. Um, so that had to be a real issue and probably still is. And in fact, you know, the classic way of doing that they want, they want, you know, for example, the, in big enterprises, they want to overcome this problem. They just, you know, invent something on premise and they want to apply it to the cloud. That doesn't, that doesn't work. For example, mm. they have, you know, they have a visibility solution in, um, in, in on premise in their data center. They just want to extend it to the cloud. And they say that we are doing multi-cloud or we are doing, you know, hybrid cloud. No, you are not doing multi-cloud. You are doing just on premise and uh, extension to the cloud. Uh -huh. We really want a product which is, you know, built specifically for the cloud, built on the cloud and for the cloud, not just, you know, an on-premise product and we deploy it in a couple of VMs in AWS and Azure and we say that we already have a multi-cloud. That's not, yeah. you know, well, this is my personal point of view, but uh, I'm not sure if you agree with me on that, but... Uh, no, that's... no, I 100% I agree. I, I think the problem is, is that a lot of businesses, as you can tell, I'm a master of analogies or maybe a failed master of analogies, but like, you go to the store to buy, you'll see where this thought goes in a minute. You go to the store to buy food, produce, meat, whatever, and you see this word natural on these food packages. Oh, these potato chips are going to be better for my kids because they're natural. Or this is the best kind of smoked turkey because it's natural. Well, it turns out pretty much everything has some natural component in it that we eat, hopefully. And that, mm -hmm. that's all it takes to use the word natural on the package. So that it's just become this meaningless buzzword that draws you in to feel like you're eating something healthy when in fact you're probably not. So yeah. I feel the same way about cloud native. I see this word cloud native sprinkled across so many different marketing solutions and so much different advertising. And, but there are only a handful of companies that really know what that means and build a solution that's truly cloud native. So I think it's hard for professionals and business owners to navigate that labyrinth, right? They, how do you discriminate whether something really is cloud native versus not? You have to get really comfortable with it and understand how it works. It's, it's hard to cut through the noise. But as I said, it's exactly something built for the cloud. Yeah. Not just, you know, built in, to be run, you know, in some couple of, in some couple VMs. And you said that you have some cloud native solution. It's not really. It's, That's it. You really have to leverage, you know, the capabilities of the cloud, the serverless. Yeah, especially the especially the serverless concept, the auto scale concept. Because if if I have some solution to be deployed in a couple of VMs, I am just having a remote data center. I am not having a cloud. That's exactly right. Couldn't have said it better. There's a difference between having something ported to a group of VMs and calling it cloud native, versus yep, a exactly. solution that understands and uses the cloud native constructs in the correct intuitive way. They're designed yeah. to work with cloud load balancing, which is fundamentally different than on-premise load balancing. And if you really want cure for insomnia, ask me about cloud load balancing at some point. I know way too much about it, and I put everyone to sleep. I crash every dinner party I go to with, with that conversation. But, uh, you know, you have to understand and manipulate cloud routing. You know, it's not just enough to have a virtual something. It has to be embedded in the way cloud works, and it has to speak the API of the cloud and have some kind of meaningful conversation with what the cloud is doing. And it has to be bi-directional. It has to talk to the cloud and then it has to listen to the cloud fabric and get input back from that and adjust accordingly. Yeah, exactly. For all of you listeners out there that are trying to navigate these different quote unquote cloud native solutions, start asking questions about these facets. You know, what does it speak the cloud native API? Does it understand cloud routing? Does it work with cloud load balancing? Mohammed, I'm sure you would agree. Yeah, sure. And especially, you know, for example, in, in load balancing, a classic way to do it in on-premise, you just, you know, a um, sandwich of load balancers, right? But in the cloud, yeah. why you could do that if you have a gateway load balancer, for example, right? So that's exactly what I mean, you know, by doing things for the cloud and doing things for on-premise, which are very, very different. Yeah, that's right. For me, cloud load balancer is an important step in the evolution. I'm not going to knock it. It's great. It's way better than just trying to put virtual somethings, whatever, pick your platform behind your standard cloud load balancer, because the gateway load balancer uses effectively some form of VXLAN tunneling, right, to encapsulate traffic and send it to a remote tenant or multi-tenant VPC or VNet in where your service stamp 
has been built and then we'll handle all the symmetry there and then send it back in through another VXLAN tunnel through the cloud fabric to the back end application. So it's kind of like this cool, clever trick to use layer three switching to get an out of band processing signal and then make it in band again. The thing about cloud load balancing though, or any of the designs of that ilk is that the thing that it's going to is typically a lift and shift solution. So it's just a bunch of palos in a VPC or it's just a bunch of F5s or it's just a bunch of whatever impervas or whatever. So at the end of the day, it's a clever way to do seamless traffic direction, but the device that's doing the processing still doesn't know about the cloud. <laughs> yeah. It just, it's, so it's like a whistle stop. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's an important step in the evolution, but it's a little bit of smoke and mirror to me. A cloud is not a remote data center. That's it. Right. If you understand this, everything would be, you know, very clear. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Well, listen, my friend, we are we are out of time. I know I've, I've taken up too much of your valuable time. This is a fantastic discussion. I hope we get to have a follow up. And I just want to thank you for your time and thank you for educating me and, and our listeners on this. It's just been uh, great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me in the show. And I am really, you know, excited. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed, you know, this uh, conversation. Yeah, likewise. Take care. Thank you very much.